listening to Harris Smith Radio. I'm your host, Wayne McPhail. In this episode, I chat with world traveler and advocate for tossing your bucket list, Heather Greenwood Davis, about how to think about and tackle travel now that restrictions are being lifted and maybe, just maybe, we can start returning to the new normal. Next up, cookbook author Claire Tansy tells us how to get dinner ready faster than a trip to your favorite frozen food aisle and back. So jet planes and fast cooking all in this episode. By the way, if you want to read Harrismith Magazine instead of listen to it, you can subscribe to the print version online at harrismithmag.com. And you can find Harrismith Magazine on selected newsstands across Canada. But for now, settle in for the next half hour of Harrismith Radio. In 2011, Heather Greenwood Davis was a successful but miserable litigation lawyer in Toronto. She dreamed of traveling the world with her husband, Ish, and her two sons, Ethan and Cameron. A one-year window opened up on that dream, and the unhappy Greenwood Davis family in tow leapt out of it. What she learned in that year-long journey about living for now and not deferring your dreams can serve us well as we contemplate travel into a world very different from the one we left behind when we shut our doors and donned our masks. Here's our conversation about stepping into the COVID departure lounge. So I wanted to talk about travel post-COVID, but before we do that, I really want to dive into um, something that that you're very keen on, this notion that travel is an agent of change. And it certainly was an agent of change for you and your family back in June of 2011, when you guys decided to pack it all up and go around the world for a year. So uh, I think there's a, a way into this. Can you talk a little bit about why and how you did that and how that experience was an agent of change for you and your family. Sure, absolutely. So June 2011, uh, my kids, I have two sons and they were then five and seven and I'm married and um, my husband had an opportunity through work. It was a four over five program. So for four years, they withhold a portion of your pay. In the fifth year, you get that back, but you don't have to come to work. And I was a freelance travel writer. So, you know, being in lots of different places over the course of a year seemed like a great idea. So we packed up the four of us and set out on this year of adventure that really did change our lives in some pretty profound ways. Um, I'd say first off, professionally, obviously it was great because it meant that I was exploring all these different places. Personally, it, it meant that the four of us were spending a lot of time together, which a lot of families until the pandemic uh, didn't know, didn't have that kind of an opportunity to spend that kind of intensive time. Um, but it also really, I think, affected the way that I travel, which is it opened me up to other perspectives. We had to be very vulnerable in a lot of situations. Travel makes you do that. We were in a lot of spaces where, but for the kindness of the people we were encountering, we could have got ourselves into some predicaments. And that really changed my approach to travel and really affected my kids in the way that they've grown up and the people they've become. So I want to talk about you first, because you were a unhappy litigation lawyer prior to <laughs> heading out, right? Um, Is there and, any other kind? <laughs> <laughs> and your, I think one of your sons anyway was very shy, right? So talk yes. a little bit about how your perspective shifted uh, personally about people uh, and then how mm -hmm. your, your children shifted. Yeah, well, I'll give you an example for myself. So, you know, like many travelers, especially those of us who travel with our, our phones and our phone cameras these days and who have seen the images in magazines and sort of have an idea of what travel looks like. Often I would be uh, traveling and might see, you know, for example, maybe I'm in Vietnam and someone is wearing a traditional hat or clothing and, you know, maybe dusting a porch or something. And you think, oh, this is amazing. I'm going to grab this shot. Fast forward to we spent 30 days in China where I'm a black woman. You won't know that from the radio, but I'm a black woman and my family is also black. And, you know, we we stand out in a crowd in China also because we're very tall and we, we literally stood out. Um, in some of the crowds and people were taking our photo and getting really excited about seeing us, some people who looked different to them. And it dawned on me that 
we really don't have a right to do that, right? If somebody came with their camera, was touring my neighborhood and pulled up in front of my house and started taking pictures of my kids because they looked cute, uh, I'd call the cops and rightfully so. And here I was traveling the world and sort of feeling free to, to take pictures and, and um, interfere in people's lives in that way, in that aggressive way uh, without their permission. So that was an example for me of you know, something that changed because of my exp own experiences through traveling. And I don't think that nat naturally would have happened on your typical beach vacation. It needed to be something that was intense um, for that to, to come forward for me. For my kids, yes, one of them was very shy. I mean, hide behind my legs shy. And uh, that was Cameron. He's my youngest. And I think what he realized really quickly was that we weren't going to be in places for very long. And so his opportunity to meet other kids and to have a great time was really finite. And if he didn't seize that opportunity, it was gone. So it only took a couple of times when we were, you know, in playgrounds and he wasn't playing for him to catch on to that. And by the time we came home, um, he was this outgoing, um, friendly guy to the point where now he's, he's super outgoing and he's got tons of friends and he's, he's always connecting people. And I really do credit the trip for that. My, my older son, Ethan, was a picky eater. I mean, like foods can't touch and they had to be a certain color and I'm not eating the macaroni and cheese if it's not orange, you know, fluorescent orange. Um, and then all of a sudden we're in these places where he's exposed to all kinds of different foods. And, and quite frankly, you know, craft dinner is not available. So he has to adjust and he has to make those, those changes and they've stuck with him. He's our most adventurous eater. He came back from a, a night at a, a sushi place last night, which is like unheard of for the kid who left here in 2011. So I do think that that experience of being out there um, and being vulnerable gives us an opportunity to change. And that's what I mean when I say travel is an agent of change. It forces you out of the comforts that you may be accustomed to. It makes you question what normal is and open yourself up to the possibility that maybe what you think it is, isn't what it is for everyone. And that there may be um, opportunities and reasons why you want to adjust that idea. That's cool. Now, I also, I didn't mention your husband, Ish, I think his name is, right? That, yeah. That, yeah. You, you, I think early on, you guys had a bit of a blow up and sort of said, okay, we're either going to come out of this stronger or we're going to come out of this divorced, right? So how did, right. <laughs> how did he change and how did it, the, the trip change your marriage? Yeah, you know, um, we're not divorced. So, so that's the first thing. That's a good thing. Good. Um, but we did, we did have this blow up where we were in a town square and what was really, you know, cool was that, you know, he sort of said, I need some time. And I said, well, I need some time. And so he took one kid and I took one kid and we walked off in separate directions, not, a, it's a town square. So by the time we, you know, marched halfway around it to cool down a little, we were right back facing each other on the other side of this square. So it was a, a quick recognition that like, you know, there's no point in, in doing this, we're, we're in it together. I think the trip changed our marriage because that has sort of been the underlying understanding. We are both committed to this relationship and we're committed to doing what we need to do to keep it going. And so I think that trip and that experience, that moment really hammered that home for us. Um, and yes, so we're still, we're still going strong. As far as how it changed him, he was a guy who, and I think a lot of your listeners will relate to this. He was a guy who was really tied to the idea of retirement. And the concept of we're going to work really hard and we're going to pay every bill on time and we're going to do everything exactly right so that at the moment that I retire, um, I'll be able to live my life. And I was always of the mindset of like, I'm going to live my life now and I'm going to make sure that I don't have any regrets at any moment in my life to the best of my ability. So we were different in the way that we came into this um, travel. And by the time we came home, he was he recognized that he didn't want to wait either. And so he's actually structured his work life to fit his life life. You know, he makes sure he does, um, he's in public health and he'll work overtime or take on on call when uh, he needs to be home. So that when we have opportunities where he can travel, he can be with us and travel. So he's totally shifted his mindset about what's important. 
So he sort of chucked the idea of having a bucket list, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't even for him. It wasn't even necessarily a bucket list. I don't think it was that fully formed. I think it was just like life starts at retirement, right? Like you work and then you live. And it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Because of course the end isn't promised. You don't yeah. know what's coming at that point. And which is why I don't believe in bucket lists. I think, right. you know, we always spend all our time filling them and never take any time to empty them. Right. So let's talk about another thing that's changed. It's been an agent of change, which for uh, for everybody, I think, listening to this is is COVID and the, the mm. two odd years that we've spent dealing one way or another, the ups and downs of that. And we're still not out of it. You know, we're certainly right. still going to be struggling with it in different ways. And and God knows there might be a new variant that comes along or a whole new pandemic mm-hmm. that that's, that's, springs up. It's very, very possible. So that's had mm-hmm. an enormous change for people. And I wanted to talk about that change in relationship to people's attitudes towards travel, because I think that there could be a really interesting psychological dichotomy. On the one hand, there might be people who think, I can't wait to get out and travel again. There's so many places I want to do. I go, I've been looking at brochures and going online, and I just got to get out there. And then on the other hand, there could be this notion of fearfulness, like people emerging from a, you know, a, a, a shelter, you know, a fallout shelter and thinking what's out there that's going to kill me. Right. And yeah. people being afraid. So let's talk about what, what are you seeing in terms of people's attitudes towards travel now? Yeah, I think you've nailed it. And I think the other thing is there are a lot of people who are both, you know, who from the shelter of, Uh, the pandemic in the sense of, you know, when they couldn't go anywhere, they could safely dream about the places that they could go. And as it opens up and the opportunity is there and sort of back in their court to decide, okay, you know, go ahead, you can go. They're sort of like, "Uh, I'm (laughs) not sure I'm really ready to do that. Um, I mean, that's, well, that's what's happening now with restaurants, right? You, when, when restaurants open, like they're going to be in Ontario, when they're going to be opening soon, I'm like that. I'm thinking, yeah, okay, it's open, but I'm not right ready yet to sit down at the table with a bunch of people close by, right? And I think that is perfectly okay. And I think it's, it's a great analogy because it's the same thing. You can decide, you know what? I want to eat from the restaurant, but I don't want to go there. I'm going to let them deliver it. Or I want to eat from the restaurant and I'm okay to go there, but I only want to go to the takeout window. Or I'm going to, you know, go in and I'm going to make sure I have a corner in the back. I'm wearing my mask until I get to my table. I I don't want anyone at the table beside me. That kind of, and I'm going to make choices that way. And you can do the same thing with travel. So you can say, listen, I'm not quite ready yet to go, you know, all the way to say Australia, but I feel comfortable going to a great cabin new to me in Northern Ontario. And then from there, maybe I'll feel a little more comfortable about staying a few nights in another province. And then maybe I'll be ready. Like you can decide how far you have to go and you don't have to jump into the spot that you left pre-pandemic, right? You can go, you can start wherever is comfortable for you. Now you did that too. Like you went with your family to, I was Niagara on the Lake recently, right? Where you just sort of said, okay, we're, we're going to stay close to home, but we're getting out there, right? Yeah. And we did it at, you know, at various spots along the last two years, there have been opportunities where we could travel, where we were permitted to travel and where things were fairly open. And we did take those. So I've been in an RV because I felt more comfortable in something I could control. And then we were in a hotel room where I, I wrote about the fact that, you know, I basically brought all my bed linens. I brought everything to clean the room. I, I brought everything because I was so nervous about it. And by the time I got there and sort of got a sense of the protocols that were in place, I was fine to just wander up with my Clorox wipes. But I was, I was, I had that fear. I was concerned about what we were going to encounter there. So I think it's, I think it's perfectly natural. And I, I wonder too, if people, if there's not a sort of a, a xenophobia that might come into play. I mean, certainly I'm thinking of like Donald Trump where, you know, calling it the China virus and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. that, that Mm -hmm. uh, there's might be a concern from folks going to other countries, one blaming other countries like China Mm -hmm. or not being sure that uh, people in other countries or the governments of other countries are taking uh, the protocols as seriously around COVID and they're going to get mm-hmm. infected again after all this time safely in Canada. How do you deal with that? 
But first of all, I, I try to point out the fallacies while they're there, right? We know it's not the China virus, for example. So we know that that's not, that's not probably um, the fear to, to be carrying forward. So some of those things are just calling it out in some of my appearances and that sort of thing. But I also think that it's about doing the research that you need to do before you're making the decision. So if you've decided that you do want to visit China or you'd like to visit um, you know, Florida or you'd like to, to go to Texas or whatever it is and you've got some concerns about it, then yeah, take a look at what is the government there doing, what's happening on the ground there. And that's the great thing right now with social media. It doesn't take many keystrokes for you to sort of get a sense of how things are being handled on the ground in different places. Um, you can check their, their news outlets to get a sense of that as well. And you make your decisions accordingly. I can tell you, I travel with, uh, at this stage, I travel with masks. Uh, I'm wearing my N95 on the plane. If I'm on a plane from the moment I get on the plane until I get off, they serve drinks and pretzels and what have you. And I decline. That doesn't mean everybody else will feel that they need to. That's, that's the way I operate. So I think you can put your own rules in place to protect yourself as best you can. But, but here's the thing, travel was never completely safe, right? There was always risk involved in making a decision to leave home. And so this is a different set of risks. Absolutely, we've seen that it can be um, a devastatingly uh, lethal risk in, in certain cases. And so absolutely, you wanna think about that carefully. But the idea that we're gonna go back to a travel that is somehow way more sanitized than it was before, I think is a bit of a myth. I think there's always going to be a risk inherent there and it's up to you to mitigate that. Right. Do you think that that people are sort of shell-shocked uh, in a way about travel, about going outside? And, and I'm thinking that you sort of the analogy that comes to mind is, you know, I think we all have relatives who, um, older relatives who grew up during the war and were, you know, saving scraps and saving pennies and putting money mm -hmm. under the bed. And even now, years later, now that they're, you know, just sold a, like a million dollar house, they're still putting money under the bed because they don't trust the banks, right? Um, yeah. do, you, do you sense that there's that kind of shell shock that people are, still need to emerge out of? A hundred percent. What I'm, you know, we've got people who, who, like you said, won't go to a restaurant or won't go to a gym. I think it's kind of weird to expect that they're going to, you know, not go to the gym or not go to a restaurant or be uncomfortable in a group of people and then, you know, climb onto a plane or uh, get on a cruise ship without any concerns, you know? So yes, I think there is a big psychological factor here. I think there's a bit of, you know, PTSD really from this whole experience mm -hmm. that people are going to be carrying forward. Um, and it, I think that's why we've got to be patient with ourselves and each other as we're making the decisions about when we go, where we go, and be really clear about why we're going um, and why it might be good for our mental health to get away for a little bit and give ourselves the baby steps, take the baby steps we need to, to do that. Now, you talked a little bit about how you travel in a, a plane, and it, it's understandable because you're sort of like a... Uh, you know, one of those Pillsbury dinner rolls stuffed into the pot and fresh can, <laughs> right? You're so cl close to everybody, right? Um, I, how how have you seen? I'm act, I just made, made that analogy up, and I'm quite amused by well it. Well done. So, just, yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how are you dealing with? Um, airports themselves. I mean, airports uh, also have their own levels of concern around being around a lot of people. How have you seen it change and how have you changed in your relationship to those spaces? Yeah. So again, and, and you know, the unfortunate about all, thing about all of this, of course, is that, um, you know, money is going to make a difference um, for people who can afford to spend a little bit more. So whether that's in choosing a higher class of seat. So you have a little bit more space on a plane or in an airport, uh, getting access to a lounge. So maybe you're not sort of in the big open air at an airport. So sometimes I'm making those decisions. I'm spending money. I'm a travel writer where often my trips are, are handled either by the publication sending me or the place that's having me in. Um, so it, it is costing me when I make those decisions. But for me, those are decisions that bring me comfort. Um, and make me feel better about about the trip and make me feel safer. So I'm, I am taking those precautions. Um, outside of that, I think, you know, it's just about, you know, I, I'm still keeping my distance from people. You know, people still 
you know, in the airports I've been in, you'll see people still rush the line, the gate, you know, they'll say we're, we're boarding zone one and zones one to five are suddenly at the gate waiting right. for their time. And I'll stand back. I'll wait my, I'll wait that out. You know, I might board a little later than I would have uh, before. Um, and I'm making, I'm just making decisions at every step of the way that allow me to feel comfortable with the travel. And the number one decision is going. So I'm really thinking about, do I want to go to this destination and why? What purpose does it serve for me to go there? Whereas before it was just sort of like I hopped on a plane, I went because, you know, there was an opportunity to go. Now I'm giving some thought to why I'm going, why I'm going and where I'm going um, before I do that. So your your mantra has been sort of go now, right? Like don't mm -hmm. don't plan on the bucket list. It's given all the stuff we've been talking about, um, is your yeah. mantra still go now? My mantra is definitely go. My mantra is uh, live a no regrets life. My mantra is that, um, you know, but go now doesn't have to mean, and if there's something on your list that you really want to do, you've seen how close you came to losing it. And if you can go now and feel comfortable, like there, listen, there's no now, if you're going to be terrified the entire time, you're not going to enjoy the destination. Uh, the whole time you're there, you're going to be afraid to do anything. Then now isn't the moment. I'll give you that. But if you feel strongly that you, you, this is something you want to do, that this is the moment when it can be done, because we don't know when this window is going to close again. And it, it very well might um, with another variant or whatever may be coming our way. Uh, then I, yeah, I encourage you to do that because what we are not promised is extra time. And I've seen a lot of people in my life who are older, who were counting on an opportunity to do a lot in the last few years, lose that opportunity and now feel for whatever reasons, health or fears or concerns, whatever they may be, have lost that opportunity probably for their lifetime. So I would hate to see people, uh, anyone else go through that i would love for people to get out there and actually live their life well, that's a, a great attitude and, and i very much appreciate the time that you took today to to tell us all about your adventures and your attitudes towards travel thank you very much no problem my pleasure that was heather greenwood davis speaking to me from toronto where she shall not be for long now it's time for a short conversation about living responsibly on our planet, brought to you by Aura Wheat Organic Bread, great taste that's sustainably baked. Claire Tanzi has been a cook, a baker, a cooking teacher, a restaurant critic, the food director of Chatelaine, and a singer in a rock and roll band when she was in university. Along the way, she's learned to cook in uncomplicated but delicious ways. Her new cookbook, Dinner Uncomplicated, unpacks great recipes about how to cook a meal in less time than it takes to listen to Bohemian Rhapsody and Stairway to Heaven back to back. I talked to Claire about fast cooking and why that can also be sustainable cooking. Here's our quick chat. Hey, Claire, thanks so much for joining us. I want to focus on one aspect of your book. I, I mean, I know you're a rotisserie chicken fangirl, but, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but I wanted to focus on the idea of cooking in an uncomplicated way that makes things more sustainable in the kitchen. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think that the one of the best things that we can do for our personal health and happiness is actually to cook for ourselves. Because when we cook for ourselves, we are always going to be a healthier, quote unquote, physically in our physical bodies, mentally, financially, and importantly as well, environmentally, we're always going to have a, a lighter footprint. And of course, my favorite uh, reason to, to cook for yourself is that you, you actually build incredibly strong relationships with the people you live with. All of those things together are a heck of an impact from a simple homemade meal. And that's the key. Keeping it simple, keeping it uncomplicated means that that daily dinner ritual is, it's attainable, it's achievable. It doesn't have to be gourmet food every night of the week. When you can make a simple homemade meal, like truly simple grilled cheese sandwiches, you are happier and healthier in all those five ways. And that is pretty special. I mean, what else can you do in your daily uh, routine that will give you that kind of impact? Yeah, so you got sustainable environment and sustainable relationships at the same time. Mm -hmm. right. 
So one of the things I liked about the book is you broke down the recipes in a really smart way, I think, into sort of time zones, right? Of 15 minutes, 45 minutes or less, that kind of stuff. So I, I wanted to focus because I, I mentioned that you like rotisserie chicken. So one of the 15 minutes or less uh, deals with a rotisserie chicken and couscous. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yes. When I was writing that chapter, I was really strict with myself. So I come from a magazine background. I was the food director at Chatelaine for many, many years running the test kitchen. So I know how mad people get when you tell them a recipe is going to take 15 minutes and it actually takes an hour, or you tell them it's going to take 15 minutes. And actually there were three other recipes you had to do beforehand so that this recipe can take 15 minutes. So I know how mad people get. I get mad too. So I was really strict with myself when I was developing the recipes in that chapter. I walked into the kitchen and I would start the timer. I would have nothing out. There'd be no water boiling, nothing peeled and chopped. If I was not eating that recipe by the time my timer hit 15 minutes, it was cut. So listen, it's it's not cheating to buy yourself a rotisserie chicken. You're going to bring it home and then you know, you're going to have something delicious with it. My suggestion is to make a simple spiced couscous. Couscous is like the easiest side dish on earth. You should always have a box of couscous in your pantry. It's basically one-to-one measurement couscous to water. Put a little zest of a lemon in there, add a few spices, a handful of currants, and maybe some toasted almonds if you've got them. And then cut up the rotisserie chicken and you sort of, you know, serve it on top of the couscous. And one of the other things that uh, you uh, talk about is that there are certain things that cooks, smart cooks do. Can you just, uh, just to wrap up, can you just sort of give us a, a highlight of some of those? Yeah, well, I think the, the smartest thing that I learned to do while I was writing this book and the thing that I see smart cooks doing all the time is making a meal plan. I really rebelled against meal plans for the longest time, but it is truly what makes dinner unstressful every single day. So if you can take 20 minutes, not even once a week, to write yourself a little plan, you are going to be so much less pressured and stressed out by dinner. It's going to just make dinner so much easier. Well, thanks very much for spending the time with us today to show us how uncomplicated cooking can be even easier. My great pleasure. That was Claire Tanzi in Toronto. So, here we are at the end of this episode of Harris Smith Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to this podcast at Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast player. And please, tell your friends and family. Got feedback? We'd love to hear it. You can email us at letters at harrismithmag.com. That URL, harrismithmag.com, is also where you can order subscriptions online. And you can find Harrismith Magazine on newsstands of selected stores across Canada. Until next time, for Harrismith Radio, I'm Wayne McPhail. And also, until next time, remember these four words. Make. Grow. Sustain. Share. Tune in for the next episode of Harrismith Radio. <laughs>